Okay. Um, I think we have a decent amount to start. People can just trickle in as they come. Um, but I'll get it started. So thank you guys, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Rihanna Azimi. I'm with the Office of Environmental Justice. Um, and I'm going to be giving a quick introduction for this seminar. So the Office of Environmental Justice is responsible for coordinating EJ work across DEP. And for this series, we've brought a few of our colleagues out to talk to you guys so you can hear directly from them about their work. Um, so this is a two-part series. We had the first part last week, um, and that was on also on funding, uh, funding different environmental projects. So to give a bit of an overview of this project, we plan this seminar series because we've been hearing from advocates that they want a resource to learn about how DEP works. Um, and they want this so that they can better advocate for their communities. Thus, the title of the seminar series overall is Navigating the DEP System. So whether you're just learning about environmental justice or environmental issues, or if you've been an advocate for a long time, there's always new programs, regulations, and also funding opportunities. And finding out what those are, what they mean for you or your organization or your community is not always so simple. So to make that process easier, we've created this series where you can learn about DEP's regulations, programs, and opportunities directly from our staff. Um, so today and last week, the focus is state funding opportunities. So the Department of Environmental Protection in New Jersey is working to ensure that overburdened communities in the state are treated fairly and part of that is ensuring that they get access to the resources they need, including financial resources. There are currently a lot of sources of money that target and prioritize environmental justice communities as a result of advocacy from these same communities asking for their fair share in New Jersey. Um, so currently a lot of that money is flowing to us in the state and we wanna make sure that people know about it, um, that it's being equitably distributed and that, you know, as many people as possible are aware that there are these opportunities out there. So today you'll hear a bit about those and that work. And so I will pass it off now to our first presenter of the evening, Charles Jenkins, who's gonna talk about funding water infrastructure projects. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Charles Jenkins. I'm the Assistant Director of the Municipal Finance and Construction Element in DEP's Division of Water Quality. I oversee both the Clean Water and the Drinking Water State Revolving Funds. I'll explain what they are. Um, you may have heard the term New Jersey Water Bank. Next slide, please. So today I'll give an overview of the Water Bank, give you some program information, go over the current intended use plans that lay out what funding packages are available, um, a brief overview of how to access the funds, and then some insight on technical assistance, which is um, efforts to identify needs and get projects ready before they actually come into the program for construction funding. Next slide, please. This is the website for the Water Infrastructure Investment Plan. This plan was developed after the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed by the Biden administration. Um, it offered significant funds in addition to our typical state revolving funds. And there's a lot of information on this website about the program, um, how the program works, various documents and guidance and forms um, that can be used to facilitate projects going through the process. Next slide, please. So how the program works, there are various sorts of funds that come into the program. So starting at the nine o'clock position on the left, every year we get federal base capitalization grants, both for the clean water program and the drinking water program. Over a five year period, we are also getting funds through the bipartisan infrastructure law. We did receive some American Rescue Plan funds, ARPA. So the state got roughly a billion dollars, I think, and this program received a portion of those overall funds for water projects. 
Also, from time to time, there are state appropriations that supplement the federal funds. And then because it is a revolving fund program, as loans are paid back, that money comes back into the system. Also, we have a financing partner called the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank. You'll see that at the five o'clock position, they leverage our funds. So I'll explain that a little bit later. We use a combination of federal, state, and leveraged funds um, to stretch the funds farther so we can do more projects. So the end result of all of that is below market rate financing. And we also have principal forgiveness, which is similar to a grant and also grants. Um, we do have a special emphasis on high priority projects and providing enhanced assistance to disadvantaged communities. Next slide, please. So on the clean water side of things, this is anything water related other than drinking water. So it's wastewater, stormwater, groundwater, and also equipment. So eligible recipients in this program are local government units. So that's all the uh, typical entities, um, utilities authorities, counties, regional water authorities, um, towns, boroughs, cities. Um, we can also finance private entities if they get the backing of a, a public borrower. And we can finance private colleges and universities for stormwater work. And we have a very small universe of those that are not eligible. So essentially privately owned facilities and federally owned facilities. So drilling down a little bit further on the eligibilities, wastewater side of things, everything from the generation and conveyance of the wastewater to the treatment plant and ultimate discharge, either the groundwater or the surface water of the state. So treatment plants, sewer mains and interceptors, and then also in our urban areas, combined sewers. So a brief explanation of what that is, a combined sewer is a sewer that typically conveys all of the wastewater to a treatment facility. But when that system gets overwhelmed by the stormwater systems that are also tied into it, a mechanism opens and that water goes out to the surface bodies. So that is a antiquated way of managing wastewater and stormwater. And throughout the nation, those um, cities that have CSOs, as we call them, are working to reduce and eliminate that sort of discharge. Stormwater management's becoming increasingly important. And there we have a variety of project eligibilities. So conveyance or treatment of stormwater to make sure it's not puddling on the ground, it's not carrying excessive amounts of sediment or solid waste out into surface waters. Also green infrastructure, which isn't always a plant. So uh, oftentimes it can be a roof, a green roof, a roof that collects rainwater that is then used for irrigation of uh, plantings. Also the traditional plant-based green infrastructure, so bioswales or uh, tree trenches. We also can finance the water quality related aspects of site remediation. So if there are hot spots of contamination, we can pay for their removal. So ultimately a site can be reused for other purposes. We also can pay for wastewater recycling and reuse. And then a variety of equipment that's used to maintain systems. So street sweepers help to keep the pollutants from getting into the stormwater in the first place. Vacuum trucks are used to maintain stormwater and wastewater systems. And then we can also finance equipment related to security and cybersecurity. And then we also do cover soft costs related to developing projects. And I'll go into more of that later. Next slide, please. On the drinking water side of things, there's a term in New Jersey, public water system ID. Essentially, we can fund any entity that has a public water system ID. So whether it's a privately or a municipally owned system, 
we can finance it. So again, we cannot finance federally owned systems or for-profit systems that are non-community systems. And here, essentially anything related to water, drinking water, we can fund. So new treatment or upgrades to existing treatment. So most typically when water comes out of the ground from a well or it's collected from a surface water source, some level of treatment is needed. Um, you may have heard of the term forever chemicals. These are PFAS and other types of chemicals that get into the water supply and they do not break down over time. They are a health hazard risk. So there are very strict limits now in place to remove them. So we are getting a lot of projects through the program to remove those forever chemicals. We also fund uncovered finished water reservoirs. So finished water means water that's been treated and is ready for human consumption. So obviously having an uncovered reservoir can be a problem because it can get contamination from wildlife or other sources. Nobody wants that. So there is a mandate that all water reservoirs need to be covered. Sometimes there's a contaminated source. We can pay to rehabilitate that source to address MCLs, which is maximum contaminant limit. Lead service line replacements. This is probably the top priority in the state currently through our funding program. No amount of lead is safe. We have very robust funding packages to address replacement of lead service lines. And then kind of uh, vanilla projects, just, you know, you have to keep the systems operating. So water mains, um, do degrade over time and we can pay to have them rehabilitated or replaced. So although that water main cross section there looks awful, actually what that is, is iron oxide buildup. So it's not toxic, but it presents a problem, as you can see, that it greatly restricts the water flow. So we can pay for that sort of um, buildup to be removed. And then again, just like in the clean water side of things, we can fund security and cybersecurity. Also resilience, which means resilience to climate or other threats that would um, keep a facility from operating. Next slide, please. So the intended use plan. There are two intended use plans. There's a clean water IUP and there's a drinking water IUP. So there, there are two separate funds. We have two separate uh, big buckets of money to fund drinking water and clean water out of. We develop these plans on an annual basis. That's an EPA requirement. When we develop draft plans, we go out to public comment. Um, the plans have very condensed information on the program, how the program works, what the source of funds are, how much money there is, what the different funding packages look like how projects are ranked, et cetera. There's a bunch of links incorporated to direct one to other sources of info, um, some explanatory pictures, charts, and graphics. Again, there's a detailed project ranking methodology there based on the type of project. Um, in the case of EJ, there are additional priority points awarded for that. Also affordability issues and regulatory issues. Next slide, please. So just to go over some high level oversights. Um, in the past, the program had funding caps. We have lifted those caps so that if someone has a project they that's eligible, they can get all the financing they need through the program. They won't have to go somewhere else, which is cumbersome and not as cost effective. We recently obtained $20 million in ARPA funds for clean water projects to address stormwater resilience. <clears throat> we have a technical assistance program, which I'll speak to in more detail towards the end of my presentation. And that technical assistance is to help communities with defining their needs, defining their capabilities, and getting projects teed up and ready to move forward to construction. We've developed affordability funding packages depending on community income levels. 
and we have new resilience requirements. So climate resilience is important. It's a federal requirement. There's also a state climate action plan. This program is in lockstep with that action plan to make sure that the projects that we fund will be equipped to handle potential issues such as increased flooding, sea level rise, storm surges, and increasing frequency of extreme precipitation. Next slide, please. So this slide just goes over how we rank projects. So there are a number of factors that are considered. One is the type of project, the type of need, how severe the need is. Also the financial condition of the potential borrower. We do offer additional priority points for EJ communities. We factor in population and also if there's a local employment program in place. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so US EPA has a requirement called Justice 40. That means that a minimum of 40% of all funding needs to be directed to disadvantaged communities. Those communities often have trouble accessing the program uh, for a variety of reasons. One thing we do try to do is make the projects more affordable through the program. So we develop affordability scores for every project or every community that comes in for financing. And that's calculated on a basis of that community's median household income divided by the statewide median household income. So for those that may not be familiar, an average is when you take an, a number of scores, add them all up and divide it by the number of data points. Median is where you select the value that's in this exact middle of a range of values. So we use that median. Um, and you may see data online about things as simple as what's the average 401k plan for households in the US and it, it may be at 200,000, whereas the median is usually much lower. So that median gives a, a much more accurate picture of a community's financial condition. We also factor in an unemployment. So if there's an unemployment rate in the community that's higher than the statewide rate, um, it adjusts the score. And then also if the population trend is less than the state population trend. We also look at environmental justice, economic overburden community criteria. And that's where at least 35% of the households qualify as low income households. Next, please. Here are our tiers for affordability. So when you take that ratio of the community versus the state income levels, if that ratio is 65 or below, we put them into affordability category one, which is the most beneficial funding packages. We also have AC2, which is a score of 66 to 80. And then we have what we call enhanced base. So if a community does not fall into one of these areas of greater need, but they're still below the state median, we recognize that there's a need. So we do give more of the interest-free funds uh, versus the interest-bearing funds. Next, please. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because time is limited this evening. This is from the Clean Water IUP. Combined sewer overflow projects, depending on the type of project. We offer principal forgiveness. That's the column entitled PF share. The PF cap column is what the maximum is a borrower can get in any one funding year. The projected PF available is the amount of funds in total that we have to address that category. And then the DEP share and iBank share are the 0% fund share and market rate share respectively. So we do see over time, there's been a strong correlation of disadvantaged communities with environmental justice communities. So we are hopeful that we can provide enhanced financing uh, for projects in EJ communities. Just a couple of highlights as I move down from the top. 
The one entitled affordability criteria, that's a general category. It can be any project as long as the community qualifies as AC1 or AC2. They can get 100% of the money free up to a cap of 2 million for AC2 or 3 million for AC1. And then we do provide a 75-25 versus our typical 50-50 base rate. And then you can see some other types of projects. Um, in EJ communities, we often see stormwater needs. So there are a couple here I'd like to touch on. Overflow and stormwater. So 20% PF might not look like much, but there is 80% US EPA grant to supplement that. So our goal there for projects is to completely fund those projects with so-called free money. Also stormwater resilience, we're looking to fund up to 100%. And then emerging contaminants, those are the forever chemicals, not only an issue on the drinking water side, but we're finding it's an issue on the clean water side of things as well. And then there is the base program. So that's the clean water for the drinking water is on the next slide. Base program is 50-50. If the score is below 100, we move to 75-25. If a community has lead service lines, but they're not disadvantaged, we do offer 80% of the 0% interest money to make it more affordable. We have an afford general affordability category, again, on the drinking water side of things. And then we have a more robust high rank affordability category. And then you see nano and very small. So nano systems have less than 10,000 customers and very small water systems serve less than 1,000. Lead service line replacements in disadvantaged communities is either 50% or 80% principal forgiveness depending on whether it's AC2 or AC1. And then we also have emerging contaminant funding, up to $2 million of free money for those projects, and also some climate change money. So one thing I want to stress is the IUP hearings on the draft are important because that's where we solicit input from stakeholders on our draft plans. And we do try to tweak these numbers from year to year, depending on what the demand is and depending on suggestions that we receive. Next slide, please. This is a high level overview of how a project moves from the starting blocks all the way to the finish line. So the first is assembling a team at the local level for communities that are disadvantaged that need some assistance on assessing how much money do we have, how much debt do we have, what sort of projects do we need to do, how do we get engage with the community. We offer technical assistance. That's free money to do that work. That moves a project or an entity through pre-planning. Ultimately, we get to the point at step four of submitting a project to us for consideration. That project gets ranked at that point. And there are two points at which we can award a loan. So we can award a loan when a project's submitted to help assist with planning and design costs, or we can award that short-term loan when a project's ready to start construction. Planning an environmental decision document here at step five. So that's the work where a sponsor identifies what is my problem issue, what are the alternatives I had available? What is the selected plan? What are the implications of that plan? So how much does it cost? How much is it gonna cost our users? Are there permits required? Are there other approvals required, et cetera? Then we move on to step six of engineering, which is the detailed work that's needed to develop contract documents to move into construction procurement. When those documents are acceptable, we issue what we call an authorization to advertise. Project sponsor goes out to bid. They work on their loan application. <clears throat> when we authorize the award, that's when a project moves into construction. Short-term loan is 
for up to three years construction period. When all the construction is done, that's when we move into the long-term loan. So over the course of construction, project sponsors engage inspection services to oversee the contractor's work and protect their interests, make sure the project's built properly. And then DEP also provides construction oversight. So the earlier slides where I talked about loan terms, loan terms get locked in when a construction contract is awarded. So up to that point, we talk about what's potentially eligible to get locked in. You do have to have a contract awarded for construction. Next, please. Technical assistance, which I talked about a little bit earlier. This is a set aside program to help communities get their projects ready, also to develop more long range plans for what their needs are. So there's a variety of types. Program navigation, that's just help along the way after a project comes in. We usually set up monthly coordination meetings with our technical staff. Financial and needs assessment, that starts before a project's even submitted to us. Again, that's looking at the financial capability and what sort of water needs are in the community. Community engagement is intended to get the word out within communities to solicit that local opinion and feedback. And then engineering services on the drinking water side of things to help communities that may not have technical capabilities um, bolster those technical capabilities. This is um, free money. There is no obligation to pursue a construction contract when technical assistance is awarded. So to supplement that free money through the technical assistance program, disadvantaged communities that do come in for the TA can also now qualify for planning and design grants. This is not principal forgiveness. This is a grant at the beginning of the process. We have $60 million of state money available for these grants. We're offering up to $2 million per project for applicants. And then to supplement that further, we are guaranteeing funds for principal forgiveness for construction. So earlier I said that you don't get guaranteed your principal forgiveness until you award a construction contract. Disadvantaged communities that come in, they get the TA, they get the planning and design grant. We will reserve a minimum of $2 million of construction principal forgiveness. Next slide, please. So that wraps it up. Um, I know that's a lot of information, but there's a whole lot more. Um, I probably won't be able to answer everyone's question in detail. More than happy to field those questions via telephone or email. If you do have such questions, please contact us versus, via that email. And thank you for attending, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, we got one question in the chat uh, from Bright. How can residents get in touch with these grants for water? So the best way to do that would be to contact your municipal officials that you've heard about this program, that you would like to know about what sort of needs there are in the community, um, if the community is coming into the program for funding. Um, there is a law in New Jersey that requires any community with a project of over $1 million to at least do a financial analysis of what the water bank could offer them in funding. And that's a, a requirement through the Department of Community Affairs Local Finance Board. So before LFB would approve any sort of other funding, 
one would need to go through the financial analysis and uh, essentially justify why coming through the program would not be cost effective. We're pretty confident the program is effective. We did um, over $1 billion in new projects last year alone. Great, thank you for that. Um, oh, and one thing I wanted to emphasize and I forgot about it along the way, I apologize. So for those communities that have EJ issues, if a project through our program triggers an EJ review, we do not approve construction of that project until the EJ process has been satisfied. So I just wanted to emphasize that for everyone. Great. Um, if any of you have other questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, or raise your hand. You can use the raise hand um, tool to just let us know that you want to ask a question out loud. Okay. If we don't have any other questions, we could take them at the end um, if you need time to process. So I'm not seeing anything else. So um, I'm gonna move jump to the next presentation where we have Martha talking about open space and green acres. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Martha Sapp from Green Acres, and I'm going to talk to you today about what we do. Um, hopefully, a lot of you have seen the Green Acres signs around New Jersey, so uh, you're familiar with at least um, what we do. But uh, next slide. Um, basically, uh, first, of all, I want to just say that we're part of a group, um, sort of a, a collection of programs in the DEP called Community Investment and Economic Revitalization. And basically, all these programs are uh, coming together to invest in towns, basically make, make communities the best place they can be through historic preservation, through parks, um, through restoring uh, properties that have been damaged by, by uh, pollutants. Um, so we're really all about making the communities across New Jersey better. Next. And what do we do? We do two things. We preserve open space and we build parks. Basically, that's it. Uh, we do. We have a state acquisition side that actually buys land for the state park system. Um, but um, tonight, I'm going to talk more about the grants that we provide to local governments and nonprofits um, for some projects. Next, and the timing for this is perfect because we just this week announced our next funding round. Um, we we have annual funding rounds usually um, in uh, February, and just like next year, it'll be February fifth is the deadline, um, and then we try to make approvals by Earth Week in April. So it's a very quick turnaround. We get um, hundreds of applications, and we do a, a pretty good job of, of reviewing them and turning them around quickly. Um, and basically, we give the we give grants and loans to local governments, and we give matching grants to nonprofit organizations to do land acquisition, park development, and stewardship projects. Those are the basic things that we do, and I'll get into those. Um, one of the things that's part of our park development is a pretty new initiative, and that's to um, build completely inclusive playgrounds. Um, a law was passed a couple of years ago called Jake's Law, encouraging um, municipalities and counties to build these parks where all children can play, um, regardless of their uh, physical abilities um, or, or any other uh, limitations they may have. Um, and so we are giving incentive funding for that for one more year. Next slide. So what can we help you buy? Uh, we can buy any land, you don't have to read the long definition, but it's any land that will be used for recreation and conservation purposes, whether it's gonna be passive open space, like a natural area or a site that you want to build a, a active recreation on or passive recreation. We do urban projects, we do rural um, suburban projects, we do parks everywhere in New Jersey. Next. And what can we help you build? Anything for outdoor recreation and conservation. We do not do indoor recreation. It's all about getting people outside. So again, active recreation like ball fields, tennis courts, um, um, boat launches, things like that, um, or playgrounds. Um, we do fishing piers. We do a, just a variety of things. Anything that you could think of of outdoor play, we'll fund it. Um, next slide. 
And stewardship. Stewardship is a, a more recent uh, category that we fund, and it's really about natural resource protection. So it's not park development in terms of um, building facilities, but it's to restore the site to its natural state. So remove invasive species, uh, clean things up, um, desnag the the uh, the streams so they flow better. Uh, really, uh, land uh, stewardship, taking care of it, putting it back to where it was before it got damaged or invaded by by uh, uh, things that, that we don't want there. Um, next. And here are a couple of success stories. I love these before and after shots. Um, there are some in Bayonne, Camden, and Jersey City, where a lot of these are urban waterfronts, which now are spectacular. But there was a time back uh, back in the day when they were kind of scary industrial places where people didn't didn't want to go. Um, and we were very happy to go in there and partner with the local governments to uh, transform them into beautiful urban waterfronts. So this is the kind of thing that we can do. Next. We want you to be innovative. Um, you know, if you've heard the song, the uh, Joni Mitchell song, Pave Paradise, Put Up a Parking Lot, well, we'll help you do the reverse, as we did here in Newark, where there was a parking deck, and we helped, we, we went in there and acquired it ourselves with their state acquisition funding, and then Essex County demolished the structure and created a park. So you can think outside the box, especially in the urban areas, just because there's a building on it doesn't mean it can't be transformed. Union City is doing that right now. They're buying a, a property that has a building on it, they will demolish it and turn it into, into a park. So we're very excited about that. Next. And we want you to be brave. Um, I mean, this is New Jersey. Uh, a lot of facility, a lot of places are, you know, th there's been some contamination in the past. Um, and some sometimes land is just, uh, uh, it's just not in the best shape. So last year, you may have heard, or two years ago, we bought the, uh, the uh, Hudson, Essex Hudson Greenway up in North Jersey. It's going to impact and benefit a lot of people, but it's going to it's it's going to be a long term project. I mean, th this shows some staff members walking along a, um, the rail line and some dilapidated bridges. And we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we knew we needed to preserve the land so that we can then work on cleaning it up and turning it into a park. Next. So we we have we have always prioritized funding for urban aid municipalities. Um, we give them better grant percentages, 75% grants and larger awards, because the way we think of it is there are more, generally there are more people in these cities and they have more uh, financial challenges cities do. So we want to incentivize them to, to invest in parks because they are such a quality of life um, issue. And in the in last few years, uh, as New Jersey has created the whole overburdened communities, um, priority. Uh, we have created new uh, funding categories for overburdened communities. And this is, this is a subset subject to adverse cum cumulative stressors. It's a, it's a mouthful. It used to be called um, adversely stressed OBCs. So that's why I stuck with that acronym. It's easier. And now when you come into us for a land acquisition or park development project, if it's in one of those ASOBCs, you get, you get 25% um, better grant funding. So if we were going to give you only loan, now you get 25% grant. If it was 25% grant, 50, all the way up to 100% grant. We also have projects, uh, another source of funding, the urban parks funding. That money comes from the state budget. And that is, we've used that um, specifically for projects that are in urban aid municipalities when the project is in one of those adversely stressed overburdened communities. Again, we're trying to see where there have been um, historically un, you know, unfair uh, impacts from a lot of different environmental and health stressors. We're trying to mitigate that and, and bring a park to help mitigate, you know, to try to offset some of that those stressors. Next. And we put our money where our mouths are. Um, so just in 2024, we made awards uh, that you see in front of you for local governments and nonprofits and the urban parks. State acquisition, we also got $24 million, which we'll spend around the state, but we are also on our state acquisition side, uh, starting a new initiative where we're gonna partner with cities and we might buy the land, and but we ask them to help us ma uh, maintain the property. And that's going to require some community help too, because in some cases we want uh, community groups or individuals to sort of adopt the parks. So this is a new initiative that we're coming up with to, to put even more uh, parks where the people live. So just in 2024, we invested over $142 million in um, projects across the state, or like as I said, urban, suburban, rural. Next. And overall, 
um, you know, more than half of our awards were in those ASOBCs and from our park developments, almost all of them were in them. So the, the better funding, the better grant funding that we offer is really making the cities and the municipalities uh, take another look and decide that in the areas that have, where the people have suffered the most, they need the parks the most as well. Um, and I'll show you a map later, but there are, there are adversely stressed overburdened communities throughout New Jersey, even in, in municipalities that are not urban, there might, there might be an area that qualifies for that. So it's not just the, the big cities that we're talking about. It's also the, the more densely populated areas and also out in the middle of nowhere, there might be a town that has had um, issues uh, with things that have been placed there that are again, environmental and health stressors. Next. So we are, we announced our funding round. Uh, we just put it on our website uh, this past week. And we're also announcing workshops that are coming up for people who are interested in applying to us. Um, the, here, there's some information here, but you can go to our website. That's where the links are to these workshops. And they're, they're for app potential applicants. And then we have questions and answers as we get closer to our um, deadline to help them um, uh, fill out the application. But um, we're getting started now because one of the things, and I'll get to that in a second, we want is public participation. And they need to start that now in order to have the project ready to apply for in February. Next. So what are we looking for? Um, of course, we are looking for projects that meet the DEP's priorities, like environmental justice, climate resilience, a bunch of other things. I mentioned completely inclusive playgrounds. That's a high priority for us. But, but these are applications that we receive from the communities. So the local priorities are really what are important. You know, there are unique needs um, in special places, de depending on what the culture is of the, of the, um, the residents who live in that municipality. So we're not dictating to you what the project should be, what where you should buy the land or what, what the park should look like. We want the, the community to decide. So we want the, the, the public engagement to start now. Um, it used to be that we would say that a public hearing at the end, just before they applied, was enough to inform the town, the residents of what, what they were going to apply for. But we realized that it's really better if the public is involved early on to decide what they want in the park. Um, we don't believe that. I, I, that, that the elected officials are the ones who know best necessarily. Uh, they're the ones who are officially the, the applicants, but they need to hear from you. They need to hear from community members, um, all generations, all types of you know uh, ages, all age groups, everybody about what they want in their own community. Next. So here's an example of a project that we did in Newark. Um, this is Nat Turner Park. It was a large piece of property surrounded by schools where of course there are a lot of uh, children. It's a community hub here, um, and it was sort of a vacant site. Next. And there was a group that that did a very um, active participatory design process. So they went out and they talked, they met with the students, they met with the communities, they had evening meetings, weekend meetings, they really um, made it, uh, every effort to, to, to get the input from the residents. And then they came into us for funding. And I'm happy to say, next slide that we went from this before shot, next slide, to the after shot. So it's amazing how um, the, public, the public's engagement creates better projects and they're more successful projects. We used to find where a town would apply to us and just let the public know just beforehand, sometimes they oppose certain things and then the project would stall and then it wouldn't be successful. So we have learned over decades that it's much better to engage the public early so that the, applic the, the application reflects what they need and they have the support before, during, and after. Because again, the, the taking care of the park is also the community's responsibility, the residents too. Next. And uh, this is actually came in with an application. Um, uh, we want you to engage everybody. Our favorite thing is the roller coaster. Um, we haven't, I don't think we've ever funded a roller coaster, but, but we're open to it. Next. So one of the things that we're going to be doing in the future is we're going to be giving out planning grants. We used to give them out probably 30, 40 years ago, um, but we're going to do it again because we realize that, again, the most meaningful projects are the ones that are well thought out. So we're going to be giving out grants for a variety of types of plans so um, a, a community can identify what, what their open space and recreation needs are, identify what parkland they already have, and then figure out how to bridge the gap. 
you know, where should we, you know, where is their uh, open space lacking in a community? And then they can apply to us to make that a reality, to actually preserve the open space or build the park where they've already decided there is a need. Um, we're going to roll those out probably the beginning of next year. We're not quite ready for those yet. We're going to stick, we're focusing right now on the regular acquisition and park development applications, but the planning grants are coming. Next. So we're putting, again, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We went through a planning process um, over the last two years called Outside Together. Next. Um, and this is, this was the, it's, it's a big name, the Statewide Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan for New Jersey. We're required to do this planning document every five years so that we can be eligible for federal funding from the National Park Service. So we we looked at who we are as a state um, you know, what, what's, what are our demographics? Where do we live? Where do most of the residents live? And how are we doing in terms of providing open space and recreation to the public, um, us as a state agency? Next. We did a huge public survey. There were 15,000 responses. Um, it was in multiple languages. It was open for a month. We had a lot of um, a lot of input from the, we had some focus groups, but we had a lot of resident input and we learned a lot. Um, next. So um, we don't have to get into the details here, but some of the questions we asked were, you know, what takes away from the satisfaction for outdoor recreation? And you can see, I put a thing in there that the biggest thing out there was bugs. People said so they stay away from the outdoors because they don't like the bugs. Um, but we also asked them about how do they find out about what's available in their parks for programming and things. And most people, it's from the internet. So this is in, informing us, and then we're also informing our, our applicants, this is how you need to reach people. This is how people are finding out about things. So if you want to get people out into the parks more or engaged in anything going on in the community more, these are some of the ways that they are telling us they learn about things. Next. Um, again, so how, oh, oh, also we wanna know how you get there. So. The vast majority of people drive themselves, um, and, and it, this is how long it takes them to get to their favorite parks. And this is not exactly what we're looking for. We really want there to be a park within a ten-minute walk of everybody, within a quarter mile of everyone's home. That's what we're that's what we're aiming for. Next. Oh, that's that's what I just said. Okay, so we have it. We do have an open space map, and it does. You know, we're always updating it as more and more land gets preserved. But the green area, um, that's parkland and open space. And there are areas where you can see there's a lot of uh, a lot of space between the green areas. So we're focusing on those with our funding to try to get those communities to apply to us for funds. Next. And these are just a couple of things that the that the uh, public told us that they wanted. They wanted more more events in their parks, reasons to get out there. They also talked about um, fees to go in, you know, to use parks. Um, for a couple of years, the state parks were free. I know the, the fees are back now, but um, these are the things that we found out through our outreach um, in our in our own planning process. And then the obstacles, again, if people don't have transportation and they don't have a local park, then they won't have the opportunity that they deserve. Next. Um, in this document, and it's online, it's on our website, there are a lot of funding opportunities listed. Um, federal funds, other state funds, just a variety. So we, we really encourage people to go look at that to see if there are um, if there's something that meets uh, what their goals are. Uh, again, it's in the it's in the uh, it's on our website in the SCORP, um, and I do really encourage you to look there. Next. Also on the DEP, we have a we have a grants and loans page. So if you go to the DEP website and go here, it'll show you all the different grants that. Um, that are being highlighted through this series, but also other ones as well. And Green Acres is on there as well. Next. Uh, this is a map of, again, showing where the urban aid municipalities, the overburdened communities, and the adversely stressed overburdened communities are. Um, the, the map changes because every year, um, some towns and some um, neighborhoods become ASOBCs and some fall out of that. So this map does change a bit. But you know, no surprise, you can see that there's a concentration of these uh, ASOBCs in the areas that are like red, those are the urban aid municipalities. But you'll also see that there are municipalities that have them that are, you know, who would think that in, in Northwest New Jersey, there'd be one of these adversely stressed overburdened communities. So they are all over and we, we want to help everybody. Next. 
But our greatest need is you. So we want you to advocate for us. We want you to advocate for yourselves um, and speak out. Uh, even if a park doesn't happen where you want it to happen, keep at it, keep trying because um, you know what you need, you know what your community needs. And so we want you to, to get in touch. We, we're just actually now adding a, a, a spot on our website where people can sign up, uh, put their email address and get information from Green Acres about workshops, about success stories, uh, about you know, um, I, uh, in, uh, ideas for ways that you can um, advocate for, for open space and recreation in your town. Um, next slide. And we also want you to be our eyes and ears. So um, there's something called a recreation open space inventory. Anytime a town has or county has taken funding from us, they have to agree to keep all of their parkland, whether we funded it or not, keep all of their parkland as parkland forever. Um, we go out and we inspect these sites, but we can't be everywhere. So we get a lot of really good information from the residents who see something bad happening. I mean, the, this one picture here is the Green Acres sign through a locked gate, and that's not okay. Um, or dumping in a park, or a basketball um, with, with no hoop, you know, with no net. Um, these are the kind of things that if we can't get to it, if you see something suspicious, we want you to call us and uh, let us, then we'll get in touch with the, the town and find out what's happening. So please let us know if you if you see something that concerns you. Next. Okay, and here's my information. Uh, there's the Green Acres sign, which hopefully you've seen at open spaces and parks in your in your community. Um, we'd love them to be again every quarter mile, um, everywhere around. And every just so you know, every every county and most municipalities have their own open space uh, tax where the, they've gone to the public, the public has agreed to pass a tax um, to, to preserve open space, build parks and maintain them. Um, and also to preserve uh, farmland if they're in those uh, parts of the state. Um, so there's a lot of money out there to be, to be used for this. Um, it, it takes a lot of work to do a project. Um, one of these projects, buying land is not easy. All the, all the easy projects are done, um, but we are committed to making sure there's uh, enough open space for everyone in New Jersey. Um, and there, there are a lot of us and we all have the right to play. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, I see one comment in the chat. Can you see it too, or should I, I read it off? Uh, it's very from interesting. Michael. It's from yeah, there you go. Michael. Okay, very interested in applying for funding stewardship projects on ex existing Green Acres land in our OBC. Is there an ideal approach to getting funding for first-time applicants? Should we seek a planning grant first? I would not wait for the planning grant because those again aren't going to be rolled out till next year. And that um you have an opportunity to apply for a stewardship grant in in uh, February. So what you should do is talk to your municipality or if there's a nonprofit, um, an eligible nonprofit nearby. Um, and you can also reach out to us on our website. We have all of our project managers listed by what county, what geographic area they handle, um, and they can also answer your questions. But um, getting started would be talking to making sure that you have an eligible applicant to come to us, um, and then we'd be happy to give you some some guidance. Our applications actually have a lot of information in them about how to get started, so I would actually start there, and those are already on our website. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, please feel free to post in the chat or use the raise hands um, function and we'll call on you. Okay. I, I had a question, Martha, actually. I was wondering, for the number to report um, like any issues with Green Acres sites, could they also call the Warren DP hotline? Um, I think that's more for, um, like environmental, like, um, emergencies, like sort of like, I guess, I guess you could, but I don't think anybody's ever, I don't know that we've ever gotten a referral from them. Um, but I guess you could, I, I just see that as more like a, like where there's a spill or a, um, mm. okay. environmental, let's, something dangerous, but it, I could be wrong. Yeah, let's share that number. What, is it this one on the slide or the, I, I think it was a different one. It was, I think it was, um, this one would work. I mean, this one, there there was a there was a number, actually, let me see if I can yeah. find it online. Okay. Um, um, and I see uh, Dave David Steinberg has raised his hand if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure. Um, 
Martha, I'd like to find out um, if if funding might be available for multiple small parcels of land, which our borough has, uh, which our borough owns. And uh, there must be about four or five pieces of uh, property. They're just literally unused. And I could see many, many, many parks. They're not very big pieces of land, but they certainly could be something where uh, people can utilize in one way or another. Would funding be available for something like that? Um in a way, yes. Uh, unfortunately, we we stopped doing multi parks um, a couple of years ago because we found that that most towns didn't have the capacity to do more than one project at a time. So we don't do multiple parks at a time, but they could come in a park at a time. Or if the parks are sort of linked in any way, um, then that could be considered one project. But if it's if it's multiple projects that are sort of standalone, um, it 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 just doesn't. They don't tend to be it be successful at doing more than one at a time, and we're trying to get projects done within a, a two year period. Um, and multiple multi parks just ended up not being um, time efficient. But but absolutely, we would we'd love to help in, improve those parks. I just don't think it could be necessarily done in one one fell swoop. Okay, at least at least it's at least you, you've given a sliver of hope. Oh, yes, we'd and, love to. Yes, we'd and, love and, to help. And as far as I'm concerned, where there's a sliver, to, to me, that's just about as good as uh, saying yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, yes, yes, yes. We want we, to help we, you. We will find out your when parts. we submit. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Sure. Um, the number that I had put up before was 609-940-4440. That's the number that people can reach. That's our compliance side. Um, but you can call the, the main DP, uh, the main Green Acres number or, or our own um you know go to our website and contact us through that too and we'll, we'll get the information to the right to the to the compliance inspectors um any other questions we have a few minutes i think oh i see from Roger Heitman, is there a grant for an art and music open space with ADA accessibility? Art and music open space? Well, we have funded um, amphitheaters in parks, if that's what you mean. Um, and everything that we build has to be ADA accessible. I mean, everything that we fund has to be ADA accessible. Um, the completely inclusive playgrounds is taking it up a notch, but everything has to be um, accessible. Everything we build. I mean, it gets, it gets a little bit... Um, confusing when it's open space projects you know because you know in terms of how much how much what the you know the trails and and uh what the surface has to be that kind of thing but regular parks or certainly an amphitheater or something like that would definitely have to be um barrier free ada accessible Okay, well, I'll stick around if anybody has questions later or throughout. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, definitely feel free to think about your questions and post them in the chat as we go. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our next presenter, Peg Hanna. We'll be talking about funding clean air, clean energy, and climate mitigation projects. And I think, Rahana, did you uh, put me in presenter mode? Yes, so Christina, I think, is going to share the presentation. Peg, you should be able to share your screen if you press the share screen button. OK, let's give it a shot. Um. That's not it. Hold on a second. It disappeared. There we go. Okay, let's try again.
Okay, all set. Sorry about that. Uh, Rahana, you can see that, right? Yep, looks great. Very good. Okay, let's just jump right in. Um, I have to say, Martha, I love your energy, enthusiasm, and, and passion at seven o'clock on a Tuesday night. That's phenomenal. That's tough shoes to a tough shoes to fill, tough uh, role to follow, but I will do my best. And thank you to all of you in the audience for um, hanging in there and being interested in learning about DEP's funding opportunities on an evening. I know your time is valuable. Um, so hopefully uh, this will be concise and get you the information that you need quickly. So today I'm going to talk about um, in all slides, but one, uh, transportation electrification funding because we have so much of it and it's spread across so many agencies that I want to make sure you at least get a flavor for some of the things that are available to you. Um, so we have a ton of different programs that fund EV charging stations as well as electric vehicles themselves um, span across three agencies, New Jersey DEP, our Economic Development Authority and our Board of Public Utilities. There are also federal grant programs available as well, as well as federal tax credits. So this is a great time for those of you kind of on the fence about transitioning to electric vehicles. This is really a great time to take advantage of some of these opportunities. So the first program and the one that I'm uh, the proudest of is our longstanding inaugural grant program for EV charging stations. It has three components, level one and level two chargers, which are what I call the slow and medium speed chargers, our first come first serve. Um, almost anyone can apply for them. You can use them for uh, multifamily homes like apartments and townhouses. You can use them for workplaces or public places, as well as for fleets. And that is a first come first serve grant opportunity. The second one are fast chargers. Those have to be publicly accessible and those are only available when we do um, an open, open competitive solicitation. And then I'm also gonna show you a slide in a minute about community fast chargers, uh, which will also be um, only open during a competitive solicitation. So eligible applicants are basically anyone, uh, businesses, government, nonprofits, uh, multi-unit dwelling owners, schools, colleges, et cetera. Um, the only people not eligible for NJDP's grant program are private homeowners. Uh, private homeowners um, are eligible for some of our utility programs, but not for DEP's programs. Um, you can see here that many of the costs associated with buying the charging station um, delivery and activation fees, warranty, et cetera, are covered by the grant. And then on the far right, you can see the reimbursement amounts. And they are somewhat proportional to the cost of the charging station. So the level one or slow charger is a cheaper charger. So we're only giving you $750 for that. The level two or medium speed chargers are a little faster as well as a little more expensive. So we're giving you a little more money for that at $4,000. So to date, we've had this program up and running for, gosh, I want to say probably six years. And we've funded, uh, we've given out about $14 million for over a thousand chargers at almost 400 different project locations. You can see the spread here. It's about 50% for public locations, about 30% for a workplace and 20% for multi-unit dwellings, which is our... Um, fancy term for things like apartments, townhouses, and condos. Um, and then you can also see the breakout for a workplace, um, workplace projects, which are equally important. Um, we are very excited that we won a national competition to specifically expand access to EV charging for New Jersey's multifamily households. So we were awarded about $10 million um, to give grants, well, to work with five communities specifically, um, Atlantic County, the Borough of North Plainfields, Borough of Oakland, City of Hoboken, and City of Jersey City. So those uh, towns will be running their own sub-grant programs. And then we will also do an open competition for 
uh, the remainder of the funding. So stay tuned for that. If you live in a multi-unit dwelling, own a multi-unit dwelling, or know somebody um, that is interested in installing a charging station in a multi-unit uh, type of dwelling. Um, so this is what I just explained. The first part of it will be a competition um, directly from us. And then the second part of it, subprogram two, will be with those five towns um, that I mentioned. So you can look for the grant opportunities to come directly from them. If you are a local government and want to go ahead and uh, buy your own charging station, we do have a state contract that was awarded earlier this year. It's valid for three years, but will likely be extended. And these are the companies that are on state contract. Um, so if you're interested in, in doing that, it might be a little cheaper than going out and buying directly. Okay, so that is the EV charging grant opportunities that we offer. I'm gonna switch over to vehicle charging opportunities. So to date, we have awarded well over $300 million for vehicle electrification. Um, our initial focus was in 2019, where we used funds from the Volkswagen settlement, and we've six, since expanded to other funding sources, so we have quite a good pot of money. Um, we particularly are focusing on things that charge at their own fleet depots rather than public charging, because the public charging is still really being built out. So we are looking to target our funding at um, groups like school buses, garbage trucks, port vehicles. So we have a rolling application process here. So you can go on our website and apply at any time. Uh, we will continually review those proposals. And as we get funding in, we'll go ahead and work through the wait list and award um, as they come in. This is just a quick summary of the dollar amounts that we are awarding for the different types of vehicles. Um, you can see we're giving a little bit more if you are an overburdened, if you are in an overburdened community. Um, the amounts that we've chosen to award are approximately the incremental cost between a diesel or gasoline vehicle and uh, an electric vehicle. So we're hoping to offset the cost um, of your new electric vehicle purchase with these funding programs. There is also a program run by our sister agency, New Jersey Economic Development Authority called NJ Zip. That has been hugely successful. In fact, so much so that it is oversubscribed. They had allocated $90 million in funding for um, truck, elect truck and bus electrification. Um, so that program is currently closed, but as an insider, I do know that that is going to reopen with a slight twist, probably early next year. It's going to be combine, combined with some financing options. So it'll be grants as well as financing um, in the form of low interest loans. So we're all excited to see um, what that looks like uh, when it comes early next year. So sticking on vehicles um, for just a few more minutes, there was a law passed in New Jersey not too long ago which asked us to focus more on electrification of school buses, knowing that uh, school buses obviously carry very vulnerable populations, children. Um, they are more susceptible to the effects of air pollution. So the legislature um, thought that it was wise to make sure DEP was focusing some funding on electrifying these types of vehicles. So we were able to get $15 million for the first year from our sister agency and announced almost exactly $15 million in awards about a week ago. So that was very exciting. Uh, we do have another $15 million to launch the second year of our program. So stay tuned for that. I would anticipate that will probably be coming out early next year. You can see some of the criteria here. I'm not gonna read through it, um, but if you are interested, I can send you the link or um, we can talk offline. I can get you in touch with the right people to give you all the details and all the granularity for the electric school bus grant program. Um, so switching gears just a little bit to 
a facet of transportation electrification that is a priority for me and is also very near and dear to me. Um, and that's something that we called, call e-mobility. Um, it's a fancy word, but the concept is making sure that everyone benefits from electric vehicles and clean transportation. We know that a lot of residents in New Jersey do not own their own vehicle. And if they do, it is likely not to be, or it, it may not be an electric vehicle. We know that the upfront costs of an electric vehicle tend to be high. Um, a lot of our EJ communities and overburden communities tend to buy used cars, but we wanna make sure that they still benefit from clean transportation. We also want to make sure that residents of all communities, but particularly environmental justice communities are able to get where they need to go for jobs, for education, for childcare, for groceries, for doctor's appointments. So we awarded money to all of these entities that you see here on the left. The program that is the most exciting of the project that is the most exciting to me is Go Trenton. It is a on-demand shuttle that takes, takes residents of Trenton to various locations. Um, it started up in October and it has seen enormous success among the residents. Um, having, since I work in Trenton, actually, I see the electric vehicle zipping by um, very frequently. And we actually did a one year uh, press event anniversary, press event for the one year anniversary not too long ago. And the drivers of these vehicles are actually residents of Trenton. So some of them were there. And it was just really neat to see that we were able to accomplish so many things with this shuttle service. So we were able to employ some of the local residents. We were able to bring clean transportation to the residents and we were able to get them to places where they normally or previously had a hard time getting to. So in case you weren't scribbling furiously as I was talking for the last few minutes and wanted to let you know that we do have all of these incentive programs summarized on our website, all in one place, um, not just New Jersey DEP's opportunities, but also those of our sister agencies, the Board of Public Utilities and EDA. Um, it's very important to me as a 33 year bureaucrat now um, that we speak and communicate in a way that makes sense to people and that is easily accessible. So feel free at your leisure to go to this link here and you can see a summary of all of the different transportation related opportunities that we have. I'm gonna talk just for a minute about direct pay. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of direct pay. When it first came to my attention, it was a foreign word. I said, the heck is direct pay? Um, but now that I've uh, come to understand it, it really is an interesting program that's come down from the federal government. So essentially, a government entity or a tax exempt entity that does not pay tax. So we don't file, so in New Jersey DEP, we don't file a tax return we can actually get a cash payment on certain types of projects if they fall into the category of clean energy projects. So you have to register for this program or pre-file, and then you claim the credit by filing a tax return. And my first question is, well, the state doesn't file a tax return, so how are we gonna file a tax return? Um, and that's created, yes, a lot of questions with our Department of Treasury and other agencies trying to figure out how to get through this process, but I know of several municipalities that have gone through it successfully um, and have actually gotten cash back um, on things that they nor wouldn't normally pay tax on. So some of the clean energy projects that would be eligible for this are EV charging stations and electric vehicles, solar installations, geothermal heat pumps, things like that. Um, just uh, very recently, I think it was maybe in the last week or so, New Jersey launched a new web resource, resource so that municipalities can uh, figure out how to do this pretty easily. Uh, here's a 
just a short snapshot of it. I haven't played around with it too much, but my understanding is that it's pretty easy to use and pretty intuitive. So you just click on the type of project that you think you want to pursue and then follow the prompts and it will tell you how much you're eligible for when you have to file based on the project year, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to give you one bonus slide. This is not about transportation and electrification, um, but when I saw the sign up list, um, there was, uh, I guess, an optional comments column and a lot of people indicated interest in planting trees. Um, so I wanted to let you know that we do have a Trees for Schools grant program. Um, the first round of it has already closed. We are working through that. The trees, um, are they were supposed to have been planted in the spring. There were some delays, so some of them are still being planted now. But we anticipate um, a second round of funding next year. The first round of funding was about $4 million, and it went to 34 uh, schools, colleges, and universities. In total, there will be about 3,000 trees planted across the state, primarily in overburdened communities. Um, we know that those communities uh, have what we call a heat island effect. Um, they have elevated temperatures because there aren't very many trees and there's a lot of paved surfaces. Um, so stay tuned in 2025, maybe spring or so, um, for hopefully another $5 million available um, in this Trees for Schools program. And that is all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing and happy to answer questions. And thank you to Chloe for putting all those links in the chat. Um, I see a question from Alexa about competitive solicitations for it pays to plug in. Um, so Alexa for the uh, uh, level two, the medium speed charging stations that is on a rolling basis. You can apply at any time for the fast chargers. We don't have anything um, in the near term, uh, no competitive solicitations in the near term for the fast chargers. But if you sign up for our listserv, which is drivegreen.nj.gov, uh, you will get notified as soon as we do that solicitation. Um, looks like there's also a hand raised maybe. Or there was, did it go down? I'm not sure. Yeah, I thought somebody named Jennifer. And Jennifer M, I see your hands raised if you want to unmute yourself and just ask your question. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So um, I'm currently doing a grant application that's due November 21st to the EPA, and it's a community change grant, and it's a $20 million grant, and um, it's all for everything you're talking about. So we are a disadvantaged community in Rahway. Um, I'm in charge of the housing authority. Uh, we're... Uh, putting into the grant vehicles for ride share, solar, uh, carport solar, this for five different agencies in Rahway, right. uh, including the schools, um, housing authority, uh, Rahway River Watershed Association, um, the Union County Utilities Authority, and um, one more, I can't remember anything anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's late, but um, it, it's basically a, like a, ton of fleet vehicles for the agencies, school buses, charging stations, um, like every single thing you mentioned. And I wanted to know, how would I go about um, setting up like maybe a Zoom meeting to talk to someone uh, about uh, what we're doing? Um, so you're looking for maybe some troubleshooting or technical advice? Um, or maybe some... Um, uh, grant dollars from uh, DEP that would sup would supplement or um, complement what we're going for from the EPA. Gotcha. So that I'm they're going... not just going to one place for money. Yep. Okay. I'm going to type in the chat the name of um, the woman who reports to me, uh, her name is Melissa Avenego. She's fabulous. She's been at DEP almost as long as I have, and she's in charge of um, all of these grant programs. Okay. Um, so Got that's it. her name in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.
Are there any other questions? Everyone's hungry and wants to eat dinner. Okay, Rihanna, turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, Peg, Martha, and Charles for your presentations. So um, next steps, this is a seminar series. Um, this is the last of the two-part state funding seminars, but we are we have been doing um, environmental justice seminars from since the spring, and we're planning some more. So please stay tuned. Um, the Office of Environmental Justice will be um, announcing more projects um, later in the fall. So if you haven't subscribed to the OEJ newsletter, please do so. We will share links with all the attendees. So if you registered, we'll send that information along. Um, and we'll also follow up to share a recording of tonight, uh, tonight's presentation. So once that's posted, we'll send that email out too. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.